Okay, looking at the holidays, what was Christmas like when you were growing up? Oh, presents were sort of few and far between. Like we had Christmas and that was, everybody had Christmas. We had midnight mass. And that was not a pleasant occasion either because we had four miles to church. And it started at midnight, okay, midnight mass. And it usually didn't start at midnight because there were so many confessions. You know, everybody had to go to confession. And, uh, well, it sometimes ran into one o'clock before church started. And then there was three masses all the time. On Christmas Eve, they have three masses. Okay. There's the main Christmas Eve mass. That's the full thing from beginning to end. And then now they don't do that anymore. They have the Mass in the morning. Then here we have Christmas Eve Mass, and there's just one Mass, and that's it. Then there's the Shepherd's Mass. That was held right after the big Christmas Mass. They call it the Shepherd's Mass. But that was a faster, because the, the Christmas Eve Mass, they sing all the hymns and, you know, really drag it out and with the full regalia, you might say. Then the Shepherd's Mass was... The choir didn't sing or anything. They called it the Stilmes. That didn't take us long. And then the third Mass, they call it the Mass at Dawn. And then that was another Mass. Like when the priest was finished with one Mass, he right away started another one. Then when that was done, he right away started another one. There was three Masses on Christmas Eve. There was the big Mass, main celebration, the Shepherd's Mass, and then the Mass at dawn. And so with that, it was probably, you know, you'd get out of church maybe at 3 o'clock or something like that, and then drive home with the horses. And sometimes it wasn't very nice outside. And then when we got home, uh, like whoever was at home in our house, then there was always, you know, something to eat, you know, after fasting, like with, there's another thing, with our religion, you were supposed to fast from midnight on, like if church was on Sunday morning, you had to fast from 12 o'clock on till the next morning to receive Holy Communion. That is no longer a custom. That went out in about the 60s, I would say, like at that time, you had to fast before you go to church from midnight on. And <laughs> I remember <laughs> the two oldest boys, sometimes they cheated a little bit. They got up in the middle of the night and had lunch, you know, so they have a peanut butter and jam sandwich and had to try and do it a little quieter. And then well, mother would hear it and, oh, yeah, what are they doing? They, she knew what they were doing. Then, of course, they couldn't go to communion the next morning because they broke the fast. You know, they cheated. Mm -hmm. It was damn strict customs. And then, well, for Christmas dinner, we always had Christmas dinner. We always had goose. Mother roasted a goose. Stuffed a goose with stuffing. She made the stuffing out of, uh, well, potato, not potatoes. Bread, you know, bread crumbs, or she, it wasn't crumbs, it was bread sliced in small chunks, you know, bits of bread, and with uh, sliced apple, you know, really, and raisins, and I suppose you put in milk to, and probably a raw egg, and stuffed the goose, put it in the oven, got it nicely brown, the skin was always brown, we always fight it over that. <laughs> and then the neck was sort of burnt pretty good, so everybody wanted the, you know, the neck, it was a little crunchy. And so that was our Christmas dinner, and uh, so we got a few peanuts and candy. And But as far as gifts go, like a Christmas gift, I think we were probably, as far as I'm concerned, probably about 10 years old before we got a gift, like whatever it was, a little 
toy or some of that. Sometimes you're lucky you get a jackknife or some of that. So did you raise geese on your farm then? Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. So that was easy for your mom to Oh, do. yeah. Like you butcher the, butcher the geese and mother would pluck them and save the feathers for a feather blanket or for pillows. Mother would save the, the feathers. And uh, she cleaned them right, like in the house. It was usually a mess when they were doing geese. You know how the feathers float around and mm -hmm. then take the insides out and ah, it was a sort of a mess in the house. Did you ever help with that process? No, never did. Didn't help us chickens neither, butchered chickens. I could, I chopped the necks off or the heads off, but as far as cleaning chickens, no, it wasn't. That was the women's job. Mother done it like shit. There's nothing to it. Um, what about, you You mentioned um, your presents, but what about a Christmas tree? Did you have a Christmas tree? No. No. There was no, no Christmas tree. That wasn't customary to buy a tree to spend money foolishly on a Christmas tree. They were only about three bucks, I guess. No. There was a, they had a Christmas cactus, like it was a flower, it was in a pot, and uh, it's a Christmas cactus, like it, it really grew, you know, about that big. It overflowed with leaves and whatnot, and it usually bloomed around Christmas time. You know, it's a Christmas cactus. But as far as a tree, no, we never had a tree until later on in the 50s. Okay. But before that, there was no Christmas tree. What about Santa Claus? Was he a, a, a big thing for Christmas time back then? Well, not really. This water the bells and eagle. It was a different custom. Like Santa Claus, well, we knew about Santa Claus and everything, but he wasn't the main guy. It was uh, the Bells and Eagle. Mm -hmm. He was sort of a guy that, well, it was a custom. He was sort of a devil. You know, he rattled a chain outside and had on a big fur coat or whatever. Bill's an eagle, and he'd, he did, it didn't happen at our place, but the custom was he'd whip the kids that were bad, you know, at a willow, and the good guy that supposedly brought the candy and stuff was uh, Grishkindl, you know, that's what it was called, Grishkindl, Christ child, actually, mm -hmm. would bring the good stuff, and the Bill's an eagle, that was a, a custom that came from the other country. What about um, celebrating Christmas in school? Was that something that Oh was yeah, well, there was Christmas concert. There's, yeah, you start practicing around the beginning of December already and put on a Christmas concert and plays. And that was common in every country school. And then the Christmas concert was probably held around the 20th of, of December. That was the last day of school. And it was a big, a big thing. It was one or once or twice it was held in the afternoon and we weren't that pleased with that because it's supposed to be at night. And then to make it look like night, they'd drape the windows, you know, to make it dark so that they could light a light. And we liked it better when it was in the evening, like nighttime Christmas concert. And, well, we put on our plays and do whatever you had to do. I remember in grade one, the part that I had to play, we had this, uh, or it was sort of a recitation. Uh, you know, every kid stood there with a letter, C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S, -S, it spells Christmas. So I remember the one girl, she couldn't talk very good. She had the R, you know, she'd say, R tans for reindeer, which pulls Santa's sleigh. And everybody sort of laughed because she couldn't speak very good. And I don't even know, I think my letter was C. And C is for Christmas with light so bright. You know, you sort of remember that. What about um, Easter? Well, Easter was, well, the Easter Abbot came. Now, okay, at Christmas too, we hang our stockings. You know, 
at the end of the bed, you know, you hang the stockings and somehow mother got the stuff in there when we were sleeping, you know, peanuts and an orange and some candies in the stocking. Sometimes somebody, when the younger ones were sleeping, somebody would go downstairs and bring some coal up and put coal into the stockings, into the girl's stockings, before mother came along with the candies, put coal in the stocking. Well, then when they'd empty the stocking, out would come the coal, and mother would be mad in hell because, well, I didn't do that. Somebody else done, you know, put the coal in the stocking. And at Easter time, to get your treats and whatnot, we put our cap out, you know, turn your cap, yes. put your cap out. Now, we put baskets, you know, for the kids' and stuff, put their stuff in little baskets with a little bit of fluffy stuff in there, but we put our cap out on, you know, and the bed or whatever, and, and then in the morning there'd be stuff in it, candy or whatnot, and a blue, blue-colored, egg, you know, for some reason they only usually colored them blue. Was there an Easter, was the, the idea of an Easter bunny back then? Oh yeah, Osterhaus, the Easter rabbit. Oh yeah. I don't know how soon we found out that there was none, but I don't know, as long as we got the stuff, let them come. As far as Santa Claus goes, like that was, I always wanted to be a Santa Claus. Like I believed in Santa Claus so goddamn bad that I believed in Santa Claus for a long time, actually. Like once we were going to school when we didn't, weren't reminded of that Bills and Eagle. That was an old custom from Lord knows where. Old Russian custom, I guess. Bills and Eagle. And yeah, Santa Claus then, like um, I believed in Santa Claus even after I sort of knew there was none. What about um, Easter in, in church? What would, what would uh, the church do at that time of year? Well, boy, went to, okay, it started on Holy Thursday. And that was a morning, a morning session, Thursday. Sometimes even on Wednesday, I think they called it Holy Wednesday or whatever. Then there was Holy Thursday. And then there was Good Friday and that was at three o'clock session. There was no mass, but they went through the Good Friday thing, you know, the crucifixion and that. And then there was Holy Saturday. And that was always a long session. It started quite early in the morning, probably about eight because I would say it's at least a two-hour session when they bless the holy water and uh, do all the readings before Mass ever started. And I'd say it was a, a two-hour session. Then there was Easter Sunday with all the glorious hymns and whatnot. And Easter Monday yet was considered a holiday. Everybody went to church on Easter Monday. And that was sort of the end of the Easter week. Have you seen a change in how you celebrated Easter in the, in the church when you were a child and Easter today? Well, I would say pretty much because everything is speeded up a little bit. Holy Thursday is sort of optional. Well, I won't bother going today. Good Friday, pretty well everybody comes. But, you know, then Holy Saturday is speeded up because they can omit a lot of things. Like, actually, a lot of things have changed since what they call Vatican II. They had a big session in Rome in about 1962, and that lasted about four years, I guess. That's when they discussed changes that were op or considered to be obsolete or no longer for us. And that's when Latin changed, you could uh, change to English. Latin was no longer mandatory. Then mass was said in English or whatever language 
was prevalent in, like if you're in Montreal and it's French, so you, you have a mass in French, if the predominant language is, yeah. And that's when things started changing. Before that, mass was said with the priest facing the altar, the altar was in front. The priest said the mass facing the altar, looking away from the people. We seen the priests back then, dressed in his vestments and everything else. And everything was said in Latin. The mass was said in Latin. The hymns, a lot of the, you know, you re respond in Latin. The mass service learned Latin and responded in Latin. I, I never was a mass server, but I started taking lessons in Latin. And then after Vatican II, and then they could say mass in whatever was predominant in. And that's when they changed, and the priest faced the people. Turned, he was turned around, and the altar was then faced. And with communion at that time, you knelt down by the communion rail, and the priest gave you communion in the, on the tongue, in the mouth. Now you can receive communion on the hand. You know, you go up the middle. And, so all those changes took place after Vatican II. And that's when things change that, you know, Easter too and whatnot. And like I said, Christmas Eve mass. So they have one mass at Christmas Eve. And they don't have those three masses anymore. With the Latin, is anything today said in Latin still in the church? No. Or? Okay. Nothing. Okay. Um. I still know some things in Latin. like Dominus Obiscum. The Lord be with you. I remember that. Um, you talked about believing in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. What about the Tooth Fairy? Was that a no. thing back then? Didn't know a thing about it. I only found out about the Tooth Fairy about 40 years ago okay. when our kids were born. I lost a tooth. I never knew a thing about the Tooth Fairy. There was no such a thing. Tooth Fairy, no. What happened when you would lose teeth when you were a kid back then? Nothing. Nothing? Threw it away. I didn't even know what a dentist was. There was no dentist, actually. What would you do if you had a toothache? Well, either you worked on it for a while and pulled it out yourself. And if that didn't work, we had a doctor at Macklin that would do that. I remember that damn plane. He pulled three teeth on me without freezing. You know, doctor eyed. He was a big, mean old German guy, Dr. Eide. So you sit in the chair there, and oh, which ones are they? Well, I guess that one and that one. So you take the plier and pull, well, uh, uh, not a machinery plier, but another plier, reach in and pull them out. Three of them, I remember that, so damn plain, I almost fainted. I remember there was a nurse there, or whether it was a nurse or just a girl working there. She sort of helped me a little bit out of the chair. I had a stang, I remember that. And I was bleeding, I was spitting it out, and I sat out on the steps in the hospital. Like, he pulled him out and he was gone, and he didn't say, well, rinse your mouth, or was sort of a nice guy, or anything like that. There Did was, he give you any cotton to put No, he or? just, no. Tough German guy, Dr. Eid. July the 1st. July the 1st? Yes. Is that the day for Canada? Yep, Dominion Day. Okay. It, that's what it was called. Now it's a Canada Day. We'll change that. Yesterday. It was Dominion Day. And well, how would that be celebrated? Well, nothing specific in the family, but we there was always a rodeo at Luceland. So we'd go to the rodeo after dinner. In the morning, we usually had to work a little bit, like pick rocks and stuff. We picked a lot of rocks. Didn't have nothing else to do, you pick rocks. And in the afternoon, we'd go to the rodeo at Luceland. We enjoyed rodeos. Were uh, the rodeos back then similar to what they are today? Oh, yeah. Bucking horses and cow milking and steers, steer riding. Yeah, that part is the same. 
Did you ever try to mimic what you saw at the rodeos on your own farm? Well, yeah, we rode calves too. Uh, you know, I always wanted to be a cowboy. I liked horses. Yeah, be a cowboy, but you know, I still got a cowboy hat. Mother bought me that when I was 16. Still got it. Really? Nice, nice, nice felt hat. Oh. So, uh, Maybe if you have it around, we'd love to take a picture of it. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, would uh, July 1st, would that be a day that the entire family would go out, or would it be just some of them? The older ones. The older ones. Yeah. Well, like, there was always younger ones. They couldn't go. Okay. Like, there was uh, two, four, six, seven younger than me. And that was about the limit. I was about the youngest one that could go. Like, Katie and Annie didn't go. There were girls besides that. Would your parents go out? On mother not, no. Okay. No, dad, dad, but mother not, no. How about birthdays? Were they celebrated when mm, you were growing up? No big deal. Okay. No, there was no such a thing as a, as a birthday cake and sing happy birthday, no. Oh, it's your birthday today, huh? Okay. We all bish tits. Now, yeah. How old are you today? Well, I'm seven. Okay. No big deal. Names Day? Names Day was a big thing. Like for the, not for us. We were too young. You had to be married, I guess. They celebrated the Names Day. That was a, everybody celebrated the Names Day. Or a birthday, like the older like Dad, they celebrate his birthday every year. But for us guys, no. Okay. Like Dad celebrated his birthday every year. That was a big deal. There was people came and they ate homemade sausage and played cards, smoked, drank home brew, like they'd get ready for this birthday. Make home brew, so there was something to drink. We were a long ways from a liquor store. Like I mean, the closest liquor store was 50 miles away. Oh my goodness. Yeah, at Corrobert. That was against, and beer, they could buy beer in a hotel at Comp here or at Macklin. But as far as whiskey, they made their own homebrew. I remember like homebrew, the thing set up behind the stove, about a 15 gallon crock. Sometimes they made it out of wheat sometimes out of potato peelings. Then they'd brew it, you know, after about 30 days or whatever it was, they, they added water and yeast, I guess, and sugar. Everybody knew when somebody was lugging out 100 pounds of sugar out of the store, you know what he was up to, make home brew. So that was their whiskey, that was their celebration. What about you? You said you would make your own sausage. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I want to talk about like that. that was, it's a, a German tradition, like German Russian thing. They make their own sausage and cure their own meat and a variety of things. Uh, we still do our own cure the meat in the brine, the hind quarters. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, Marie sort of does that. We use tender quick, and that sort of puts a flavor to the meat, like salt, and sort of cures it. Like it can probably lay around for a while and it won't spoil because of the salt and some other things in there. And we keep it in, in that salt mixture, like in a plastic container, and she puts it on and uh, it turns the meat red, like meat is generally red, but when it's cooked, it sort of gets a little on the white side or whatever. This here gives it a, a red appearance, this tender quick. And then we smoke it after it's been in this salty brine for about eight or 10 days or whatever. We smoke it. And then of course it's pretty good. Like we like it a lot better than this store-bought stuff. I don't know how in the hell they can ruin meat as badly as they do. Yeah, we, well, we sort of haven't made any sausage for about two years now, but we always made and 
I grind the meat and stuff it in the casings with the sausage machine and, and smoked it and whatnot. But there's just the two of us here now, so we buy homemade sausage. Though we still buy homemade sausage, not from a, a store. We buy it from friends that run a farm butcher shop. They do it on the farm. They make homemade sausage, like mix it and stuff it. So when you were a kid and you would make sausage, would this be an occasion where you would, uh, extended family would come over and help, or was it just something you and your Well, family? the neighbors would come. Like butchering was a big day. Like when they butchered two or three pigs and, and a beef and whatnot, in the fall of the year, you get your winter supply. Yeah, it was a big day. Oh, I remember that plane that boil water to scald them, to take the hair off. And somebody would shoot the pig and string it up. And then after they were butchered and in the house, that's when the work would start. They'd cut them up and grind the meat and make liver sausage. And I never did really like it. And, uh, Head cheese. How do you make liver sausage? Well, they would grind the liver. Actually, they would cook it. They would cook the liver and some other parts of the pig. Sort of part of the pig that came from the head and all that, the chowls and that. They would boil that until the meat would come off the bone and the liver was ready. and. Then they'd grind it and, and uh, mix it with salt and pepper and stuff it in casings. Most of the people liked it, but I didn't like liver sausage. Never did. And head cheese, that too was made similar to uh, liver sausage. And they would grind up part of the rind and, and uh, well, liver went in there too, I guess. And they'd stuff it into the stomach, like dad would clean the stomach of the pig, scrape it and clean it and dis not disinfect it, but clean it. And then they'd stuff this full of, full of this stuff that was ground up, like some rind and liver and fat, I guess, and whatnot. And in German, that was the Schwadermal. And the people just loved it. You know, when you eat that cold, they'd boil it then, in a big pot and then it would be cooled and mother laid a board on top, like in a cool place, laid a board on top and put a rock on top for weight, you know, to sort of press it. And then it would be sort of a solid piece, press it. And when it was pressed down good, after a couple of weeks, it was sort of cured, just like cheese, you know, they cured cheese. And then this was this uh, head cheese in German. It's and that was always a big feast at our at Dad's name's day, which was December the 14th. People would come in and they'd eat this head cheese for lunch and Mother would make sausage and uh, they'd drink home brew and play cards and smoke. The room would get so, they'd play buck. buck. It's a card game called Buck. That was a German card game. I've never heard of it. Buck. Yeah, I know how to play it. Hmm. You, you it's, a, it? it's a very complicated. Okay. It's, in, in English, the name of the game is Black Queens. Like, they're sort of the boss. The two Black Queens, the club and the spade, Black Queens. And if you lost, well, then you, you got the Buck. They called it the Buck. The loser, they got the Buck. The game went up to 10. They had a hell of a time with that. Anyway, they'd sit and play cards till all hours of the morning, and they, everybody smoked. And that time they had uh, the mantle light. You know, it was a kerosene light that hung on the ceiling. And when the room got so smoky, the smoke would rise. The room got so smoky that the lights started going out. You know, it didn't get enough air to keep going. Were and they smoking cigarettes? Cigarettes. Or pipes? Uh, yeah, well, cigarettes, yeah. Okay. I don't think they knew anything about pot that yeah. time. No, cigarettes, cigarettes, everybody smoked. Not like tobacco pipes or anything like that? No, or? no. The older people smoked a pipe, like grandfather smoked mm -hmm. pipe. But uh, no, they had a good time. The women sat around 
in the living room talking and chewing sunflowers. None of the women smoked. Chewing sunflowers and the peelings, they'd always spit them on the floor. There were sunflower peelings all over when, you know, when the day was done and everybody would go home. Well, then they'd sweep, sweep up the sunflowers. And it actually was beneficial on the floor because they're a little oily. You know, and they'd sweep and they'd oil attracts dust and whatnot. So they had a clean floor after they swept with sunflowers. And in the room where the men were playing cards, well, there was ashes all over the place. Like very seldom used ashtrays, like the ashes went on the floor. And uh, the cigarette butts, they sort of buttered them out on, stepped on them, put them what out. What type of flooring was in the house? Wood flooring, wood flooring. And the matches, they'd light the match under the chair. You know, the chair was wood. And they'd take a match out and strike it underneath the chair and light the cigarette. And if you look at some of the old chairs that are still around, you, you can see where they struck the matches. It makes a mark every time you strike a match. So that was one of the things. And then sometimes it stormed, like, you know, the guys would stay till all hours in the morning was cold. And at that time, the roads were a little better already in the 50s. And well, then the truck didn't start, you know, because they couldn't plug them in. It was cold. Well, then they'd stay. Some guys, they'd be there then for two days, you know. Ah, oh, damn it, you know. Couldn't get going, couldn't get home. So mother was busy, you know feeding them guys and whatever. With the cigarettes, were those something that they could go and buy at the store or did they have to roll their own? Well, it was roll your own. Okay. They rolled your own, except, well, for that special occasion, dad sometimes bought cigarettes. You know, there was 50 cigarettes in a pack. They called it a flat 50. And then of course you pass them around and everybody got a tailor-made players in a tin box. But mostly it was roll your own. Dad smoked sweet cap. Other guys I remember smoked Ogden's, Ogden's tobacco. How often would your dad smoke? Oh, pretty well smoked steady. Okay. Smoked in bed. Like I remember that. Like going downstairs sometimes and he got up early and made the fire. We didn't have, we had a coal and wood stove in the house and an oil burner. And the stove would go out overnight, the coal and wood, get up and light the fire. And sometimes we'd go down to their bedroom and he was sort of, had been up already. And he sort of went and laid down again on the bed, like on top of the blanket. He had his pants on already and that. And he'd be laying there smoking. You know, what else? He smoked with a cigarette holder, like you roll your own, that red rooster paper, a thin, it was like tissue paper chandelier. It had a red rooster on. Did you ever see cigarette paper? Mm -mm. Never there was a hundred leaves in a, in a little pack, in a little book. Hundred, you could roll a hundred cigarettes with that. And they were cut to size as long as a cigarette and about this wide with a crease in the middle and a little bit of glue on there. When you finish rolling, you wetted that glue and Made it nice and round, tore the tobacco off on the end that sticks out and put it back in your pack. And then you light it. Oh, I, I started smoking with roll your own. This is what I, what I was going to ask. Has any of the children ever tried to sm try smoking when they were kids? At home in our family? Oh, yeah. Girls didn't, but the boys all smoked. Yeah. When you were 14, if you didn't smoke, there was something wrong with you. Like, it was common. But right now, we got, I don't think the, our kids never, ever tried smoking. But, uh, oh, I, I roll cigarettes, roll your own. Dad smoked with a cigarette holder. Uh, most people smoked with a cigarette holder because those, that, home, that paper, this uh, cigarette paper, kind of stuck to the lips. Mm. And uh, Dad had a, a thing cut out right here uh, from smoking on his bottom lip. And it, at that time it was cancerous, I guess, but he didn't die from cancer. And then after that he smoked with a cigarette holder to avoid the cigarette on his lips. How about the alcohol? Did any of the children ever get into the alcohol? 
Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Is of that course. a common thing? Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. You know, um, I don't know what. Um, the drinking age in Canada is lower than the U.S., isn't it? Like 19 or something? I think it's 18. 18. 18 now. At yeah. that time, it was 21. Okay. Was it 21? Okay. Yep. That's what I was but it's 18 now, I guess. Okay. Um, you mentioned that your dad died young. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, he died in 1957. He was 59 years old. That's a come I know he was born in 1898. And uh, I was taking him to Macklin. He was in the back seat of the car. We had a brand new car. A 57 Ford and I was taking him to Macklin he was in the process of a heart attack and he was dead before I got to Macklin so that was the end of that and on the way to Macklin uh, there was all dirt roads and we had a new car and it was quite fast like it was lots of power and they were quite low to the ground, you know, they were built low. And I had her not to the floor, but I was doing about 100 miles an hour. And a rabbit was on the road. It was about 6.30 in the evening, June the 14th. A rabbit hopped out of the ditch onto the road. And somehow the rabbit, that rabbit went through the windshield of the car. It, yeah, it landed in the back seat. It w put a hole through the windshield, right where the mirror is. It uh, broke the mirror and put a hole in the windshield and landed on the in the back seat. Went right through the windshield. So, I don't know, the rabbit must have jumped when he, you know, got onto the road or something but he went through the windshield. He almost went over the car, like he hit the top part of the windshield where the mirror is right in the middle. And he went through the windshield. And uh, Dad was dead already, but uh, whatever, that was, that is what happened. How old were you when your dad died? Uh, 19. And um, how many younger siblings did you have at that time? At that time, younger than me? Mm -hmm. Seven, younger. At that time, they didn't use an undertaker yet either. Like now, when there's a funeral, the undertaker comes out and does all that. Uh, I don't really know what happened after that. I dropped, I dropped Dad off at the hospital at Macklin. They didn't take him into the hospital. They had a little building behind the hospital. They called it a morgue. But it was just a shack, a wooden shack. That's where they put him. And somehow, I think there was an undertaker at Macklin. They called it an undertaker. And anyway, he sold coffins, I guess. And he must have dressed them and got them ready and put them into the coffin. And we took them home on the back of the truck, home to the house the next day. Then, of course, they have uh, the wake in the evening. And then we put them on the back of the truck and took them to church. And there was the mass there and they buried him like there was no such a thing as the undertaker being there and putting him down the grave and all that. People, men done that. The, the uh, well, you ask somebody to do that, they let him down, down the grave with ropes, rope around the bottom of the coffin until he hits the bottom. Then they pull the rope out put the cover on and then people start shoveling dirt in. It's not like it is today. Th there was no undertaker there. What did, what did a funeral service usually uh, consist of back then? Well, I just sort of said right now, and that was about it. Nothing, nothing too much different than... No, there was pallbearers. I was one of the pallbearers. And there's pallbearers and carry the coffin down to the cemetery. The cemetery is right in the churchyard. And, and uh, the whole congregation was down there. And the choir sang some hymns, I remember that. Were the hymns in German? Or? Oh yeah, German, German hymns, yeah. 
And then that was it. We went home. Um, how did your life change after your father passed away? Your responsibilities? Well, we, we had to take the farm over. Like, we were doing work anyway. Like, But we had to, you know, do all the stuff that Dad done. I'd never been in a bank before. Bank wasn't a common thing. When they haul to get grain, or no, nah, not to get grain, what am I? To get cash after they hauled grain, uh, the guy in the store, he had cash. He handled cash for the, to cash checks and whatnot. Everybody went and cashed their check in the store. He had, you know, he carried the cash. Or at the post office. There was no bank there. There was a bank at Macklin, but nobody, everything was dealt with in cash. Dad had cash. Everybody had cash. Unless you didn't have any money at all. You didn't have anything. But if they sold cattle or whatever, well, they went to our local store at Cactus Lake and cashed a check, like whether it's a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. They carried cash for a bank. And then, of course, the storekeeper or the postmaster, probably once a week, they took these checks to a bank and made a deposit and got more cash. It wasn't common practice to write a check. When your father passed away, what um, condition was the farm in? Oh, it was an excellent condition. Like, we had good facilities. We had good equipment, and we just carried on. Like there was six, seven quarters of land paid for. Everything was paid for. There was no debt. And there was uh, cash, cash around. Well, then when we sold, hauled grain or something, and then mother handled the cash, like for the farm. We cashed the check and gave it to mother then, and mother looked after it, and if we needed money to pay bills, mother would give us money, like to pay the gas bills, or like we charged up the stuff at the store to pay the grocery bill. Mother would give us the cash then. And, or when the parcel came from Eaton's, the COD parcel, well, how much is it? Well, 80 bucks. Well, then mother would give you 80 bucks and you'd pick up the parcel at the post office. Cash. And I remember they hid cash here and there in various places. Like it wasn't just in one place under the mattress or in the desk drawer on the bottom or something like that. If there was a little extra cash, it was outside in the yard somewhere. Like, you know. Some guys dug it under the ground in a tin can or whatever. But we were hauling grain, like there was uh, grain around, full granary and whatnot. Dad had the habit of sticking a can of cash in the wheat, on top of the bin. I sometimes wondered why he was crawling up the ladder, opening that little door up on top, and sort of in the bin, he'd stick a can of cash in there. It might be a thousand bucks or whatever. We were hauling grain one time afterwards, after Dad had died and whatnot, we were hauling grain. And we had the auger stuck in and augering grain out. And the grain, you know how grain runs down, funnels towards the auger. And all of a sudden, here comes this tobacco can. We, like, we didn't know it was there. He didn't tell anybody where he hid the money. And here comes this tobacco can and uh, open it up, or oh, here's a roll of cash. So we gave it to mother. And actually when mother passed away, 29 years later, she still had this roll of cash. It wasn't exactly necessary that she needed it or whatever, but I just found that out not long ago. Like the girls got the house and that. And uh, they said that mother still had this cash from in that can. I don't know how much was there. Was there a thousand bucks or something in the neighborhood, probably? 
Did your mother ever re remarry? No, no, it wasn't even in her mind, I don't think, no, mm -hmm. no. Um, on the break you had mentioned uh, World War II and the, the experiences that it, uh, or the uh, impact it had on your childhood. Do you want to share a little bit of that with us? Well, we, we knew about it because we seen it, we could listen to the radio and there was always big news on the radio and uh, see it in the paper and whatnot. <clears throat> but it was one of those things you couldn't speak German at school like it was against the law. And if somebody told or told on you that you talked German, you were punished for it, like you got a strap or whatever, but I never I never got a strap in school for misbehaving or whatnot. And uh, like our neighbors, Honickers, because they were German, not German-Russian. They were, his dad immigrated right from Germany. And of course, they knew about that, that he's a German. And he actually did have a few guns around. And from what I gather, they confiscated his guns. And he had to report once a month or some of that to some officer that, you know, they're not really on the German side. They're Canadians and whatnot. But... That was some of the rules, I guess, that if you're a German, you're a German forever, I guess. And uh, so that's about it with the war. But uh, when we seen a plane going over, it was a, a rare thing, but occasionally you've seen a plane and heard them and, well, and then mother would say, yeah, the Abandon Kuma River, like they were sort of scared of the Japs for some reason or another. I don't know. Probably after that bombing in Pearl Harbor or whatever, or the Japs done that, and they sort of said, "Well, if the Japs come here and see a plane, you know, those, those are the Japs coming." But nothing. It wasn't that at all. Like it probably was a trainer training planes or whatever. But but outside of that, uh, Uncle Joe was in the army. And I remember him coming home on leave and that. He, you know, he have his uniform on and we'd see that or know that. How old were you when the war broke out? Well, I was born in 38 and the war broke out in about 1941. So I was actually three when it okay. broke out. But as it progressed, like 1944 and that, like I was six years old. And I remember that damn plane. We, we're on the, the Coleman farm here, uh, situated on the southwest quarter of 13, 36, 22, west of the third. And actually this farm here belonged to my father-in-law, Simon Kratchmer. And uh, I got married to Marie, and I just started farming from there. When we first started here, there was four quarters of land here. And as we got more help with Warren and Brian. We expanded our farming operation and now we farm 40 quarters of land, which is 10 sections, 6,200 and some acres. And Robbie is here, that's uh, Brian's son. And here comes Annika, that's their daughter. She's in grade one now. And some equipment around the farm here, there's a, a swather here, it's a 30 foot Macdon, it's got pickup reels, and that's to to assist in the swathing of canola and down crops. The pickup reels are for that. It's a 30-foot swath, and the reason for that is you cut your crop before it's really mature. We don't do a lot of straight combining. We swath it, leave it on the swath for about 10 days or so, and if the weather is right, and then we combine it, and it's picked up with a combine, it's got a pickup on it and that picks up the windrow. And over here is a, another one, another 30-foot swather. We use that for the same purpose. That's an IHC. And uh, down there, that part of the yard, there's a grain auger. It's a 13-inch tubing. It's 70 feet long. We use that for unloading grain trucks into a bin or into a pile. And there's our uh, air drill. We use that machine, it's a 54 foot for seeding our crop. 
We do continuous cropping, that means we don't summer follow. To begin the seeding, the farming process in the spring, we do what they call a burn off. We spray to kill the weeds and then we proceed to seed with that machine. And that's a once over operation. We'll just continue on down to a Quonset and unless you want to take a, a look at some bins here, we're, we've got about nine bins in a row in the back row. Then there's these bins here and the Quonset there. And the truck is loaded with flax right now. It's going to be hauled to Loose Land. They're going to sell it this afternoon, I guess. And uh, there's one of our service trucks. It's a one-ton Dodge with a trailer hooked on. And we'll just continue on down to the, the Quonset. Some other equipment. So when you were growing up, you didn't have any of this equipment, did you? Uh, no, th no, not we did have uh, tractors and and that, but we didn't use the same process. We we summer followed then, okay. and we seed it with a disker. Uh, th this technology that we've got now just became available in the last fifteen years, I guess. One of my earlier trucks. It's a 1970. I just kept it. It didn't trade it off when we bought it. Uh, here's another, another swather here. It's a pull type swather, a 36 foot. You need to put a tractor on the end of it to pull it. The others are self propelled, so that's different. Uh, here's a water truck. We use that to haul water to our sprayer. When we do our spraying. And uh, here's another one of our grain trucks. Uh, tandem GMC grain truck and just ahead here there's our sprayer it's what they call a high wheeled sprayer uh, Patriot Brian Warren runs the sprayer he does the burn off it's uh, well you don't need a tractor for that one it's a high wheeled sprayer and we supply water to the sprayer with our water truck. In a good, good day, he can spray probably around 1,000 to 1,200 acres if we can keep the water. And here's our uh, straight cut headers. When we do straight cutting, this is a new 36 foot uh, honeybee. And that, that one combine is not here right now. It's a new combine. Uh, it's at Unity right now in the shop. We bought it new last year during harvest. We had a bit of a disaster last harvest. We lost one combine in a fire. And uh, the header and the combine went up in smoke. So the next day we had a, a new one in the yard. What happened? Uh, it uh, caught, caught fire uh, something... On the, in the engine it started, and it didn't take long. Leanne was running the common at the time. We were straight cutting barley. And back there is another straight cut header, another honeybee for the combine that we have here in the yard. We've got it out right now, getting it ready for uh, harvest. And the new combine is at Unity at the dealership to do some updates. There's our tractor. That's the one we use for seeding. Brian runs the tractor. He does the seeding. And I do the grunt work. I supply the, bring the fuel and haul the fertilizer, bring the fertilizer to the field and the seed grains to the field to, in order to keep him going. We have, uh, like we seed around 6,200 acres and we do that in a time period of about 21 days. We spend about 21 days seeding. So everything pretty well has to work and be in place. You have to be really well organized to be able to accomplish that. In That's sort of our timetable of 21 days. Brian draws up the schedule that we're going to keep, sort of decide on what we seed where, and it's on a sheet of paper there and we sort of know what we're doing. He draws up the schedule in wintertime about and we start with seed peas first. We like to start about the last week in April, peas, and then canola, 
and then we seed barley, durum, and we end up with wheat. This year we seeded a soft uh, spring wheat, soft white wheat. It's supposed to be for ethanol. We're building an ethanol plant at Unity. So that's where that soft white wheat is gonna go. We invested quite a pile of money in that. It's a $25 million project and it's big stuff in the US already, ethanol production. We're just getting into it. Okay. It's on, in the process it's of uh, collecting money. They wanna raise $10 million locally and I think they've achieved that now. And when that's in full production, uh, we'll be able to haul 45,000 bushels of soft wheat to that ethanol plant and it's supposed to pay big bucks. So that's our next venture and we hope it's successful. <laughs> well, this tractor here, this has to be quite a change from when you were... A yeah, it is quite a change. Yeah, it's a four-wheel drive. When I was at home on the farm, we didn't have anything that size. Our biggest tractor was probably about... 85 horsepower, and that was about the biggest that they, this year is 425. Okay. So it's a, a big change. What crops did you guys uh, grow when you were growing up? What? Well, it was pretty well the same thing. We grew oats and barley, and that was for feed wheat, or not feed wheat, pardon me. That was for feed for the livestock and that. And we grew wheat, and that was hauled to the elevator eight miles away, and now our elevators are... 35 miles away to these big concrete elevators and they disposed of the wooden ones and we, we bought one, so. So you said you were kind of the grunt man now. You, you do all the delivering and taking yeah. for people. What, were, you, what your, were your responsibilities when you were growing up? Well, it's sort of, well, I, I run, I done seeding at, you know, once you're 19 and 18. We done the seeding, but we done it sort of different. You fill the disker with Wheat by pail, you know, now we fill with augers and whatnot. And uh, yeah, well, you've done the chores as well. You know, milked, feed the pigs, and put up hay. We don't do that, we have no livestock. Okay. Nothing, None? nothing. No. no chickens, no pigs, no nothing. We don't have any grass. So everything is put into cereals or pulses. Did you ever have any livestock? Not here, no. not here, no. No, no. You just went to strictly crops? Yeah, okay. because we really don't have the wasteland. You know, it's cropland and so that's what it is. When you first started farming this, how much land did you have? Uh, five quarters. Sam had four and I bought one the first year we got married. Okay. I paid $7,100 for that quarter. And it was a real bargain. And, and how much do you have now? Right now we have 40 quarters, and now like that's 10 sections, that's like 60, 200 acres more or less. Okay. So what year did you move out here? In 62, 1962, we got married and I moved, well, <laughs> Annika just learned to ride her bike and uh, just, just about a month ago and she's actually pretty good at it. Oh, you look like you're an old pro. Yeah, like she rides it good. And, uh, well, there's a, t a tractor and a blade. We use that to move snow in the wintertime and, and uh, move a little dirt in the summertime if we need to. There's a snowblower for, the little, uh, for that tractor there, the little tractor. And uh, then a water tank, we use that when we need to uh, for spraying and that. But this year we didn't. We take it right out of the dugout. And then we can just continue on. Uh, we have another... Quonset over there, and there's some other e equipment in there. Okay. So you got married in 1962. Yes. Well, how did you meet your wife? Oh boy, I guess we used to just cruise around on a Sunday afternoon, and you sort of go from, well, stop in Looseland and keep on going to the next town. We stop in Tram Lake, and there's some girls walking up and down the streets, and you sort of wonder who they are, and you stop and ask, well, what's your name and that? And, uh, you want to go for a ride? Yeah I, and, yeah, I suppose I'll go for a ride, and then you want to go to the show too? Yeah, I guess we'll go to the show too. And then, uh, well, what else? Should I come next Sunday again to go to a show again? Yeah, if you want to. And so it just took off from there. How old were you when you... Uh, Probably 22. Okay. 
we got Marie said I was 24 when we got married, so that so that must be about right. You went to movies and, and dated, for lack of a better word, than yeah. for for two years. What did your parents think of her? Well, Dad wasn't here anymore, and Mother was satisfied. Her version always was, "It's it's yours, you know. Whatever you take is is what you get." and there was no interference in one way or another, like, well, she's no good, or I don't want to see her around or anything. We got, uh, we picked up some railway ties yesterday. Uh, you know, they tore out ra railway ties on the railroad track, mm -hmm. and uh, they went and picked some up. We used them around the farm for maybe doing a little bit of, well, build a, down by the dugout and that. On your, on your farm that you grew up on, did one of your older brothers stay on that after he got, they got married to work it or? Uh, yes, okay. like my oldest, not my oldest, my oldest brother is living on grandfather's farm. He's not living there anymore, but that's where he, he took over grandfather's farm, Wendland. He's retired now, he lives in Macklin. And on our farm at home, Andrew, he was the youngest, he took over the, <coughs> he took over the farm at home. And my other brother, Jerome, he farms alongside there. He's got okay. a farm not far from there. <coughs> so it's all being, it's all being in the family. And yes, all yes, work. yes, it's all in the family, yeah. So here is a, we have some more equipment here. That's, well, not our chunk room and that, but it's another Whoa. grain truck that is around here. It's a smaller one. It's just a three ton and uh, tracked with a front end loader and, uh, Another swather. It's a, a 30 foot massing. It's uh, the header is here and the rest of it is is there. We disconnect the two to get them get them into the shed. So how many swathers do you need to work the, the amount of land that you have? Well, we have three self propels, three 30 foots right now, and a 36 foot pull type. But actually, we only I guess would need two. We want to sell one. Okay. You know, we we we're getting a little bit too much stuff around here and the rest is just sort of uh well you gotta have some place to put the the stuff that doesn't fit in the other place like extra oil and and uh well transfer auger and just small stuff and so these quantities did you build them yes yes in 90 this one was built in 1968 actually okay and the other one down there the big one was built in 1986 building out back there. I was just going to say, <laughs> that's a toilet. Is that an old outhouse? That's an old outhouse. <laughs> we have the house there. There's Leanne. Where's she going? Oh, Pardon? Getting some mail. There's no mail today. We get mail three times a week. Oh, really? It's all we, uh, three times a week. Hmm. So, when you used to live here with your wife, did you have to walk all over no, the we, house? No, we never or? lived here. Oh, okay. We never lived here. Okay. Uh, nobody ever lived here until Brian moved the house in about five years ago. Okay. And uh, So the old outhouse, when, would, when did that get put on? Well, actually, we moved it here probably about eight years ago before there was a house on, okay. the, on the place. So we, we moved the outhouse here, and it's there. We, it happened to be on a farm that we bought. We have another farm south of here. Okay. And that was on that place, and I thought it was the best building on the place. So we, we, we moved it here. <laughs> Was it like it is today where it's like one, a lot of big farms or was it a lot of smaller well, farms? Well, at that time there was really no big farms. I'd say six quarters might have been the big one. Uh, but now it's getting like pretty big. We got a neighbor just out west here that probably farms about 50 some quarters, a okay. little over 50 quarters. And then we have another neighbor over that way that farms at least that much. And there's always guys quitting, and somebody has to buy that land. Yeah. And so some farms get bigger, and not, some become non-existent. Mm 